We are, we are on the home stretch, which is a horse racing metaphor. Um, and, and in good races, that's the best part. And so we're, we're very uh, gratified to have uh, such an outstanding concluding panel. Uh, and for Mr. Bilt and Megan O'Sullivan will be out here in a second. But I wanted, before we actually end and everybody races, but I'll be ahead of you to the bar, um, that's why I want to do this now. Uh, I want to thank the people that um, made this happen uh, and, and made it work so uh, seamlessly in, in kind of every dimension. Um, and so I want to bring the, the, the folks from our team, the Nuclear Policy Program, who've been working on this for months. There are other people who I will... Uh, come on. The, I, I, I'm going to, I'm going to, oh, thank you, hold your plug. I'm going to, I mean, we mobilized the whole endowment, basically, for this. So, so the people who checked you in, the people who've been passing the microphones on, they're all colleagues from other programs at the endowment or from the library and from the communications team and so on. And they, they've been wonderful in donating their time and, um, and being dragooned for this, uh, for this effort. So we're, we're deeply... Uh, gratified to them. We also have had um, conference planners who helped set up the online registration thing and, and did a lot of the preparatory work, and it's Linder and Associates, and so we would recommend uh, them to you. And then the people who've been working on this um, most intently, ranging from, you know, last few weeks to, in Toby and Maddie's case, you know, the last uh, nine or ten months. Um, so I want to thank Amber Kirtley, step forward here. Um, Brian Radzinski from our program. Alexandra Francis. And then, and then these two, um, who really have, uh, well, I would have jumped out the window a long time ago. Um, but I've, I've, I've heard every once in a while the exclamations uh, that made me think I would jump out uh, the window. Um, but, but Madeline Foley and Toby Dalton have just been uh, outstanding, and they've actually done the thing. And, and so to the extent that it's worked, uh, it's, it's their doing. And so I want to thank them, and I would ask you to thank them. <laughs> Good afternoon. It's my pleasure to moderate this final panel of this fine conference and to be with you today. My name is Megan O'Sullivan. I'm the Jean Kirkpatrick Professor of International Affairs at Harvard University's Kennedy School. And I'm here this afternoon with Foreign Minister Carl Bildt, who, as you all know, is the former minister, the Foreign Minister for Sweden. And this is a position he's held since 2006. And previous to that position, from 1991 to 1994, he was the Prime Minister of Sweden. And in the interim, between serving his country in these two positions, he had a number of appointments at the UN, including being the UN Secretary General Special Envoy from the Balkans from 1999 to 2001. And I'm sure, as you're all familiar, Foreign Minister Bildt is one of the leading and most respected foreign policy thinkers in Europe. And it's really our privilege to have him today to talk about an extremely timely issue, and that is sanctions and their relation to nonproliferation. What I'm going to do is ask him to take the podium and give us some comments to flesh out his position, and then we'll have a conversation before turning it over to you and your questions. So please join me in welcoming Foreign Minister Bildt to the podium. Thanks very much for those uh, kind words. And let me just start by saying how much I appreciate this opportunity coming to you here and uh, having at least some opportunity to listen to your discussions and deliberations. Those of us who are in the business of, let's call it policy implementation, do the thing, uh, 
we are extremely dependent upon the interaction with people like you, the policy analysis, the policy shapers, the policy critical community, in order to invigorate the thinking that is needed for us when it comes to developing policies. And of course, the subject that you are dealing with here today, yesterday, uh, nuclear non-proliferation is uppermost in our concern. How we should prevent the further spread of nuclear weapons and move step by step, hopefully, towards a world where nuclear weapons are no longer. But that's not really what I'm going to talk primarily about. I've been invited to make some comments on the question of to which extent sanctions can be an appropriate instrument in this particular regard. And I suspect that I've been invited because I belong to those who have perhaps a somewhat dissident view if you compare it to somewhat of the tone and the tenor of some of the public debates. But let me start by making, I think, one important distinction. There is no doubt whatsoever that the different regimes that we have in place for restricting access to critical technologies are extremely important and have been overall somewhat of a success. You have some 40 countries who, on their own initiative, have joined together. We have five different export control regimes. You, you know them, the NSG, the Australia Group, the uh, MTCR, the Vassenar, and the Sanaga Committee. And Sweden, my country, we are, of course, a country that once upon a time had a fairly advanced nuclear weapons technology capability, however you want to phrase these things, but it was a program that was very advanced indeed before we closed it down. And we also developed a fairly advanced civilian nuclear industry over the years. We have had every reason to take these uh, restrictions extremely seriously over the years. But when we are discussing sanctions here, we are not discussing these things. We are discussing the sanctions as an instrument of punishments in order to achieve a certain change in policy in the country that we decide to put under sanctions of some sort. Economic sanctions, of course, is nothing particularly new. It's been around more or less forever as an instrument in the ongoing struggle between states. You can think of the continental blockade that the Royal Navy tried to impose on uh, Napoleon in order to get him to capitulate. It required, at the end of the day, Waterloo as well to achieve that particular purpose. And in modern times, of course, numerous examples where sometimes also rather massive sanctions have been put in place in order to try to also unseat regimes or try to get them to change their policies. Once upon a time, the West tried to get rid of the Bolshevik regime in its early days in Russia with sanctions. The League of Nations tried to punish Mussolini for Abyssinia, for Ethiopia, with sanctions. And the United States, if I don't remember it wrongly, tried sanctions against Japan, and that was the prelude to what turned out to be Pearl Harbor. And then, of course, in uh, slightly more recent times, some other examples that should be mentioned the United States have had in place what might be referred to as crippling sanctions against the regime in Havana for well more than a century by now. This, as you're all aware, of an academic debate about the effectiveness of sanction. And it has to try to identify cases that have been success cases when it comes to the utility of sanctions. Few cases are absolutely clear-cut when you try to analyze them, but I believe it is fair to say that the success cases are, to use an understatement, not overwhelming in terms of numbers. I would even argue they are not too many. In terms of non-proliferation goals, uh, the most acute example that we've had in more recent times was, of course, the very strict sanctions imposed on Saddam Hussein's Iraq following the Gulf War. They are in a category of their own, I would say, for two reasons. First, they were, of course, imposed by the Security Council, with all that that entails. And secondly, they were of a severity that you very seldom see. Total trade sanctions, that is very seldom indeed. 
As we can discuss whether they worked or not, that's a separate debate, which we shouldn't necessarily go into, at least in my introductory comments. But of course, we became aware at that particular time of some of the side effects of sanctions. We saw how the middle class was thrown into poverty or driven into exiles, while, of course, the regime continued to build its palaces. And in the wake of that, we got a new debate about how to use sanctions. There was a new debate about what was called targeted measures or smart sanctions, and we had something called the interlocking process, and we had something called the Berlin bond process, and we had even something called the Stockholm process in order to try to get smarter than we thought that we had been when it came to the application of the sanctions against Iraq. Whatever the result of these particular intellectual deliberations that happened in the wake of the Iraq experience, I think it's fair to say that we are now in a new cycle of sanctions against different regimes. I see that very clearly from our European horizon. We EU foreign ministers, we meet in the Foreign Affairs Council every month at least and take decisions. And I would think that at every single meeting, we have decisions on new or revised or amended or updated or whatever sanctions. You can look at the figures. In 2010, we took 22 decisions on sanctions. In 2011, the figure was 69. I don't have a figure for 2012, but rest assured, that figure was even higher. And there's, of course, no doubt whatsoever that sanctions are and sanctions should be part of our toolbox, preferably and primarily through decisions by the UN Security Council, both for the sake of the legality of them and for the simple sake of the effectiveness of them, because to get everyone on board, of course, dramatically increases the effectiveness of the sanctions in question. But sanctions can only work, and that's my key point, if they are part of an overall policy where the, where the entire arsenal of instruments that we might have are clearly geared towards very specific and identifiable objectives. Sanctions can be part of such a policy, but sanctions must never be a substitute for policy. And sometimes, I have to say, that this rather fundamental distinction tends to be lost. In my view, economic sanctions are more likely to influence the policy choices of a regime or an actor at two different phases of what we can call the clash of wills that is there and leads to the imposition of sanctions. The first is when there is a discussion on whether to introduce sanctions or not, because then the actor in question knows that he can take things in order to avoid sanctions being imposed. It is often said, um, and I think I've even heard it here, that the agreement between Iran, Turkey and Brazil in May 2010, the Tehran Declaration, was meant primarily from the Iranian side to avert the imposition of sanctions by the Security Council. If that is the case, and I think that might well be the case, then that is, of course, an extremely good illustration of this point of mind. Another debate, but we can take that later, is whether we wouldn't have been in a better point at this point in time if we, at that point in time, had chosen that particular road. But that's a separate debate. The second phase, where I think sanctions can influence policy, and I've seen that in a number of cases as well, is when uh, there's a clear incredible credible prospect of them being lifted as part of some sort of diplomatic package. But the intervening period, when we have a gradual increase in the pain level, where we sort of expect that gradual increase in the pain level to cause the regime to change course, is uh, significantly more problematic. And the history, the record of the history of uh, that is, I would add, rather discouraging. Gradually, regimes and economies adjust also to sanctions. New structures always emerge. There are also those that are winners. They're not only losers of sanctions. They are significant winners of sanctions. It was mentioned that I've been working on the Balkans for quite some time, and uh, there were extensive sanctions in place in Balkans. 
I saw the enormous gains that those sanctions reduced or gave to different smuggling structures closely allied to X numbers of different regimes. And once you are in that particular business, you see the profitability of it. Even when political conditions change, it's very difficult to get out of that particular extremely profitable business that then have been established often then with some sort of state support. So there are those profiting from isolation and decline and are often more or less part of the regime. And more often than not, of course, we see that the regimes are directing the anger of people, uh, the anger of the population against what they consider the foreign forces or the foreign evils that is imposing this pain upon the nation. I know, as a matter of fact, of no case where economic despair caused by sanctions have caused the nation to rise up and topple an unpopular regime. I know quite a number of cases where the political effect has been the worst. Once sanctions have been imposed, there is a risk of uh, self-perpetuating slordage in which the targeted country tends to dig its heels deeper and deeper, while the side pressing for change issues increasingly impatient calls for broadening and widening the what they call resultless sanctions in anticipation in wave after wave that they would finally at some point in time bite. And it's against this background that I question the tendency that is sometimes there to turn to sanctions as one of the first instruments of defense in every crisis. And that I would argue that sanctions are more properly applied, carefully if applied at all, during those particular two phases that I indicated during a prolonged contest of wills that you can describe. Iran is, of course, a case that we all are looking at very carefully indeed. I saw a recent report in town by the National Iranian American Council that made the case that international sanctions have had a profound effect on the Iranian economy, but have had virtually no effect upon the policies of the Iranian regime. And if that, case, if that is the case, of course, we have sort of two policy options available to us. One is to further reinforce, strengthen, widen, augment, however you want to phrase it, in the hope that at some point they will more or less break the back of the regime. It might theoretically happen, but it might take a very long time. And in the meantime, of course, completely different things might happen and fundamentally alter the scene. The other is to be precise and credible in a policy of offering, offering to lift sanctions as part of a diplomatic offer. The historical evidence, I would argue, without going into the details of the case at the moment, but the historical evidence gives a somewhat better chance for this latter approach. This being said, I'm acutely aware of the fact the political fact of life that it is far easier to impose sanctions than to actually lift them. As a matter of fact, if you look around town here, I, I, think, you are, I think you are still struggling with lifting some of the remaining sanctions against Russia from the age of the, remember the Soviet Union was around, it was sort of two decades ago, but anyhow, there are still some things in place that has been turning out to be somewhat difficult to lift completely. And that once sanctions are imposed, there is, of course, a risk of sinking down in the quagmire of endless sanctions without either effect or purpose. For all that I know, as of this afternoon, Fidel Castro is still around, and uh, his brother is still in charge. And without sanctions, I very much doubt that at least the latter would have been the case. The former is with more higher authorities and powers. North Korea is, of course, an even more difficult case to discuss. We are faced with a regime that, through its policies of self-sufficiency, are de facto, you can argue, hurting and sanctioning itself. If they truly, as we read in the declarations now, intend to close down the Kaesong Industrial Park, I think it does itself, the regime, more economic damage than I think that any conceivable set of sanctions at the moment imposed by us can cause the North Korean economy. What's the logic behind what they're doing? 
that is beyond me. But here clearly the role of sanction in our old, of our old policy mix would by necessity be somewhat more limited. If we look back then on more than a half century since the first nuclear bomb went off in the desert of New Mexico, the record of non pillarif proliferation is, of course, mixed. Yes, a number of countries have acquired nuclear weapons. That's the bad side. Yes, they are far fewer than was thought. That, I think, can be said as the good side. But if you look back, I think the role of sanctions in achieving this rather mixed result is, as a matter of fact, fairly limited. Israel, according to rumors, acquired nuclear weapons in spite of fierce opposition, not the least, by the way, by the United States. India and Pakistan did the same, in spite of both the threat of sanctions and sanctions actually being imposed upon them in order to try to get them off that particular course. And for the different nations that at one point or the other in their respective cycles of development decided not to acquire nuclear weapons, I believe that other factors were if you analyze it carefully, far more important. Among these nations, mine, Sweden, among them, factors of security were probably preeminent. When they started to analyze the situation, they found that the acquisition of nuclear weapons would actually decrease their security in a number of ways, rather than increase security, and they started to engage in those, those issues with the outside world. So, Finally, my overall conclusions are somewhat cautious. The broader non-proliferation agenda that we have, the MPT, the CTBT, the IAA, the safeguard system, the rest of the international regimes that I mentioned, is what really counts to meet the, change, the challenge, the threat of a further proliferation of nuclear weapons. Sanctions are and sanctions should be part of our arsenal of instruments but they should be very carefully considered. And if they are implemented, they should be part of a carefully balanced policy to achieve very specified objectives. They could be part of a policy, but they should never be a substitute for a proper policy. Thank you. Thank you very much for those comments. Uh, you made, I think, very, very important points about how sanctions only work in the context of having very specific goals. And I'm completely in agreement with you about those particular phases where sanctions mm -hmm. seem to be the most effective, when the threat of sanctions is apparent. And actually, rarely in these academic studies you referred to, do people take into account mm -hmm. the threats of sanctions or when sanctions have the prospect of being lifted. And then, of course, your final point about it being difficult to actually discern um, the effect of sanctions in an overall policy is one to keep in mind. I thought I might just ask you a few more questions to kind of flesh out your, your thoughts on the sanctions. And one of my pet peeves about sanctions is when people say sanctions don't work. Um, you would never hear someone say diplomacy doesn't work or military force doesn't work. And I think you're you, in a... You would, as a matter of fact, but that's well, a separate issue. Well, <laughs> it seems that you, you and I are probably in agreement that these are tools, mm -hmm. um, yeah. and tools have to be combined together yeah. to create a strategy. And certainly that's the case with sanctions. Um, so I'm wondering if you could reflect on when, you know, what other tools are most complementary to sanctions, and how should sanctions be packaged together with other tools of foreign policy to create the best prospects for success? Well, I, I happen to be of the school that believes that diplomacy can actually work. That on, diplomacy, on its own. Well, on its own, but be the primary instrument in the overall policy mix. Then you can support diplomacy with perhaps an element of sanctions, sometimes particularly popular in this part of the world, with a military threat, although you have to be rather careful with issuing military threats because there's a risk of you having to actually implement them or impose them or execute them, and then you enter into a completely different ballgame. And there could be other things. Uh, diplomacy, of course, comes in different forms. I mean, even security counts, bilateral, track B, all of that. 
and it's very different in the different cases. But what, 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 what I think there is now again, there is a tendency, I see it perhaps more, well, I see it here as well, when I follow the political debate, I have to confess, but I see it on the European level as well, that every time there is a challenge and there's always the, the pressure on governments to do something, mm -hmm. um, sanctions to be, tend to be the first line of response or action or whatever you call it, and sometimes without really doing the overall analysis how this can be achieved. And I said, what we often tend to forget is that sanctions do have effects. They do change economies. They do change societies. And you, you, can, you can get that change rather fast, but get that particular society and that particular uh, economy back into normal thing, that is a somewhat more difficult thing. I have my Balkan experience where we are still struggling with the networks of organized criminality mm -hmm. that are there, that are in effect of a sanctions regime that was effectively lifted 15 years ago. Yeah, yeah. No, I think that's a, a very fair point, that diplomacy might be the mainstay of your strategy, but sanctions can actually help get a party to the table. Well, what, 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 what we have also, uh, also, on the European side, is quite a lot of what we call restrictive measures. Mm -hmm. uh, we can impose that sort of fairly limited, but these are restrictions. Um, which are fairly effective in certain cases because they want to go shopping in Paris mm -hmm. and other places. Uh, not everyone necessarily, but people who are really sort of a powerful positions or persons related to them anyhow. Um, those things can be quite painful to them and sometimes cause them to change policy. But then we are probably talking about sort of minor policy changes that we can impose or try to get them to, to do with these measures. But we have quite a number of those things. Mm -hmm. We have the freezing of financial assets sometimes, um, which we are doing. The legalities of that, if you don't do it through the Security Council, are quite complex, particularly when it comes to lifting it again. We are struggling with that in the Libya case still. Um, but these are the sort of smart instruments that we believe we have. And in a case like Iran, mm -hmm. um, and knowing your position on the Iranian sanctions and Sweden's position on the EU sanctions, do you see that sanctions actually were part of getting the Iranians to the table? Or do you think that actually a coercive element to this policy would have been sufficient if the sanctions had been the much more targeted, much more limited sanctions that you're referring to? It seems that if you're trying to get a country to give up uh, a policy that is so fundamentally tied to its interests that there needs to be some coercive element, even if it's in support of diplomacy um, rather than in place of diplomacy. Well, there's, there's very much argument in debate at the moment that sanctions did get them back to the negotiating table. I mean, you, you, you can argue that. You can also argue, of course, if we go back to the Tehran Declaration in May 2010, they were at the table. And then came the sanctions decision and they left the table. And then two years later, they are at the table. Uh, so you can argue that the debate caused them to leave the table and the entire thing caused them to go back to the table. You can argue that both ways. And the historians or the academics can, 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 can fight that out. Um, then, of course, we, we, we are dealing with a regime uh, we, and we are dealing with a, a very big policy of theirs. You can discuss what the policy is. If we are to believe our respective intelligence agencies, they decided in 2003 to end the sort of the sort of the weaponization the real weapons program i mean we know for certain that they they did have a weapons program with all of the components that you need for that we know that they took a political decision to end that one and you can just the weaponization part of that program. well they dispersed the things i mean they, it was more than that as a matter of fact uh, but not the enrichment program right uh, as a matter of fact that accelerated to be precise mm -hmm. um and, and the interesting thing is, of course, why did they do that? And um, I've, I've not been able to interview the Supreme Leader on it. Um, yes, it is somewhat shameful. I'm not quite certain I would get much out of him. But you, could, you can have two theories on why they did that. One is that they found suddenly U.S. forces in Afghanistan and U.S. forces in Iraq and there was a lot of sort of rhetoric coming out of this town which sounded rather threatening. That might be one of the reasons. Another reason, conceivably, and I'm saying this without knowing the answer, is that up until then, I mean, the defining, there are a couple of defining things in Iranian history. 
modern history. One of them is the war with Iraq. Sure. Saddam Hussein was the big evil for them. Mm -hmm. And they heard people say that he was very close to acquiring nuclear weapons. And they didn't really believe that if he acquired nuclear weapons, he was going to use them against Israel or anyone else. They were absolutely convinced that he was going to use them against them. According, you might say, there was a certain logic in them starting to do something in order to acquire the same thing. We saw the same with sort of chemical weapons, as mm -hmm. you remember. Mm -hmm. And, of course, when Saddam, for reasons, in April, 10 years ago, Today. disappeared from the scene, uh, and it turned out that there weren't very much of nuclear weapons. You can say that that particular logic behind the program disappeared. So those are two... I mean, they don't necessarily exclude each other. No, I, I'd say they're not mutually exclusive. No, quite. So it's perfect logic, if we take these two explanations, why they took the decision in 2003. Then you might argue, why do they continue? And uh, two different theories there. One is that they really want to build a bomb. The other one, and they're not mutually exclusive, is, of course, pride, technology, a nation that has seen itself deprived uh, from its right by Western powers. They're back to 1953 in Mossadegh all the time. They want to do this in a regime that wants to demonstrate that they are among the big regimes of the world in terms of the technology. And sort of the difficulties that we have here is trying to really interpret exactly what they think and what they do. Uh, Iran, for all of the complexities here, though much easier than the other case I mentioned, North Korea. Mm -hmm. We can sort of, there's an element of rationale in what we can interpret the Iranians are doing. Um, if we go to the Korean Peninsula, I think that's become a somewhat difficult argument. And just um, staying with Iran for the moment, so you, you believe that regardless of which one of these rationales is dominant, that the Iranians might be willing to give up this pursuit? That well, whichever the pursuit we are talking about. Um, uh, are they prepared to give up uh, sort of nuclear technology? No. No. Irrespective of regime, I would say. I mean, we have a fairly, you have in this country and we have in my country, a fairly significant Iranian diaspora. If I ask them that particular question, the answer is a resounding no, not going to happen. Uh, they want to be a modern nation, and a modern nation allegedly is supposed to have nuclear technologies. Uh, do they want to give up sort of the capacity to develop nuclear weapons? And then we go into rather difficult exercise of what that actually means. Mm -hmm. They did acquire a lot of that knowledge prior to 2003. Uh, they have been continuing some activities since then. Uh, some of those activities, I can tell you, we do in Sweden still. Uh, within our sort of defense research establishment in order to know certain of the technologies involved. We don't have, for the record, no weapons program. <laughs> for the record. <laughs> but I dare say the international community would be more comfortable with Sweden going down this avenue than yeah, with but, the current yes, government but, in Iran. Yeah, but I would not. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> and uh, you are the well, I, government, I, so... No, because the, uh, I, I think the, the Swedish case is quite interesting. Because you might argue, why, did not, why didn't we acquire nuclear weapons? Because we could have done it, no question. Mm -hmm. We were very close. Um, because when we started to analyze what it meant... Uh, how to use them, in which constituencies, what is deterrence, what is actually wartime use of them, we found that it was uh, the people that, apart from public opinion to a certain extent, but the people that really turned against it was the military guys. When, when they started to do the planning, they said, hi guys, this is not going to work. This is going to get us into more trouble. Um, uh, that's, I think, a hopeful element in it. That one, once you try to analyze what it is beyond the prestige element, right. which some people, and we have that in the rating case clearly, but beyond the prestige element when you try to analyze, very often you find that it causes more problems than, than it uh, solves. In your opening comments, you rightly pointed out that sanctions are used for different goals, for punishment, um, for regime change, in an effort to get uh, a government to change its behavior. Mm. One of the consistent problems with sanctions is that when they're employed to try to bring about behavior change, so often the country in question sees the sanctions as more than that, sees the sanctions as really an as effort change. to change the regime. And quite clearly, uh, the supreme leader, everyone 
who has interviewed him, uh, is mm. correct, mm. Um, sees the sanctions no. as an effort to bring about the end of the Islamic mm. Republic. Mm. How can we be better as the international community about being clear that these sanctions are for a specific purpose and that would enable more uh, productive discussions, diplomacy, diplomacy to work, rather than this idea that this is really about regime change. Is there some way to clarify that, or is that just an inherent downside of the tool? I think that is an inherent downside of the tool, uh, but I think we need to think more carefully how we can avoid that happening. I think it's nearly unavoidable that a regime where we impose sanctions are going to answer with that. I mean, to take another example, uh, Mr. Mugabe in Zimbabwe. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, we have, uh, from the EU side, we have, I could hardly call them sanctions, but they're restrictive measures anyhow. Uh, very light, not very much, as a matter of fact. You can argue it should be more, but I mean very, very little. He has been able to use that. In, uh, I mean, it's a profoundly mismanaged economy, as you know, p- to put it very mildly. Yeah. Uh, but he has used the argument all the time that this is an effect of the sanctions imposed by the evil outside world. And you can argue, I don't know if that's the case, but you can argue that the very, very small things that we've done in that particular respect have probably helped him to stay in power by him being able to use that particular argument. Um, Have we then been sufficiently good in our sort of public diplomacy on that particular point? Probably not. Uh, One of the lessons is that we must have more public diplomacy associated with this. We must much more clearly define what we are doing we must also very clearly try to devise sanctions so as to avoid too many unintended consequences. I mean, to take the Iranian case again. Uh, when we, um, in the EU, uh, whatever that was, half a year ago, or something like that, had debate on the latest round of the sanctions that we imposed, we uh, deliberately, after debate, uh, had a very large window, both for anything medical or humanitarian, and for personal transfers. I mean, sort of, we have 90,000 Iranians in Sweden. Uh, they send money back to their families. You have uh, Iranian students who are studying abroad and they are dependent upon their parents sending money, those sorts of things. And in our sanctions policy, there's a very clear opening of that. But we've not been able to communicate that. Um, we've not been able to communicate that to the financial institutions who are so scared that even if things are legal, perfectly legal, they're afraid of doing it. Um, and we have not been able to communicate that sufficiently clear to the Iranian public opinion, who are tending to blame us for problems that are starting to occur with medical supplies in Iran, which are not an intended, I would say, effect of sanctions policy. Unintended, perhaps. We must be better at managing those sorts of things. Sure. You mentioned that sanctions can have an effect on an economy, but not bring about a change in policy. Mm. And this, I think, is a very important Mm. distinction. By what measure should the international community decide whether or not sanctions are effective? And by whatever standard you would choose to define, how would you assess sanctions on Iran, sanctions on North Korea? You, You interestingly mentioned that you thought North Korea was a much more difficult case than Iran. Um which seems to put it in a very high category of difficulty. Could you explain a little bit more why you said that? Well, because I I said, I mean, the the, the doctrine of the North Korean regime is self-sufficiency. I mean, this is a country that deliberately isolates itself from the outside world. So, I mean, for example, their number one money earner is now this sort of co-industrial park that they have with South Koreans. And uh, that's really where they earn the little money that they get. When they close that down, if they do, they're inflicting significant pain on themselves. I mean, what's the rationale of such a regime? Mm-hmm. I don't know. Um, uh, so it's difficult. I mean, there have, there have been cases where very selective measures applied. You might remember this Macau Bank thing. Sure. Go back five, six, seven yeah. years or whatever it is. Um, but that was sort of a specific thing geared to a specific policy objective. And as such, it could work. Uh, otherwise, difficult. I, I'm not an expert on the Korean regime, but, and I have yet to find anyone, by the way. <laughs> I was just going to say that. Um, though you could make the argument that the North Korean regime, for all that we don't know about it, probably decision-making is concentrated in 
one oh, or yeah. two people. Oh, yeah. Whereas, again, the Iranian regime yes. is opaque, yes. but we do know that there are various factions and that a lot of the decision-making that we see in Iran is a product of very complicated mm-hmm. machinations. Mm-hmm. So in some ways, do you think that sanctions really need to take the domestic um, oh, yeah. conversations absolutely. into account? Oh, and are, they, are we sophisticated enough to do that? Well, I mean, or should we not try the to answer, that game? The answer to that question is, of course, to say no. Uh, we need to think f- much more about those particular issues, mm-hmm. um, difficult as they are. Um, as you said, the, the, the regime in Iran is not, sort of, it's not a totalitarian regime. It's an authoritarian regime. But within that regime, mm-hmm. there are fiercely competing forces. I mean, the, the scenes that we see from the... That parliament and what we hear from the public debate, I mean, that goes. You know, that's what we find in sort of the public debate of certain other countries within the limits of the regime. Uh, are we sufficiently uh, sophisticated in playing the games of domestic politics of Tehran? I doubt it. Uh, I don't think I would be sufficiently... I, I'm, I'm hardly competent to play the domestic political game of Sweden. Um, uh, I doubt that. <laughs> or Denmark, to take another example. It's, yeah, here we go into difficult terrain. Uh, yes, yes. <laughs> but, but, but Korea, of course, a different magnitude of issues um, when it comes to that. And, and, of course, when you go to another, which is uh, India, Pakistan, of course, that we go into more, that's a more rational thing because they have taken their decisions on we might like, not like it, but you can see the rationale that has driven them, and that we've got the Chinese in the background and uh, other things. Indians. And, uh, well, I think you've made a very good case, and you concluded with this comment, that you're skeptical about sanctions mm-hmm. playing a really vibrant role in resolving these very difficult questions. And as a former policymaker, I can't help but ask you, well, then what? What works if sanctions don't work? And again, trying as this conversation I think is reflected, to be a little bit more about the combination of the tools and all of that, but specifically looking at Iran, looking at North Korea, what do you advise? What do you think the international community should be doing differently to produce better results? In both cases, we seem to be at potentially very dangerous uh, standoffs. Looking at, and as I said, I leave the North Korean case to those that know it. I invite we, anyone. We, we, yes, we welcome you all to... In the, in the Iranian case, um, where we know far more, yeah. uh, I, I, I would be ready to say that there have been missed opportunities also from our side. Uh, clearly, 2003, 2004, things could have been moved. I mean, there, there was the offer by the media, or transferred by the Swiss, which happened to coincide with when they closed down the program, and there were a couple of other programs. We had the Europeans there, and uh, they implemented the additional protocol for, what, two or three years, or two years, or something like that. Uh, We missed that opportunity for X numbers of reasons. Um, We have the second, which happened sort of the the spring of 2010. Um, That's still sort of, people have different views on that. I still believe that we would have been in a better place today had we taken the Tehran Declaration and not. It wouldn't have sorted out all of the problems. But but all of the 20% issues that we have now or after that, they came as sort of, when that failed, the Iranians decided to do the 20%, uh, claiming it was the research reactor that might have been an element of correctness in that, but primarily as a diplomatic aim to up the ante. And now we are dealing with the effects of that. So looking back on the negotiating history of Iran, uh, which I think we should do with open eyes, mm-hmm. I think we should look at the fact that there are, have been opportunities that probably were missed. You can never be certain. Mm -hmm. and then try to see at which point there might be factors that are fairly similar. Um, And then I would argue that then, of course, this is a question of building some sort of trust. I mean, on paper, on paper, if you take what the West is saying, de facto saying, and what the Iranians are saying on paper, it's virtually the same. Uh, they have no intention to acquire nuclear weapons. They intend to stay in the MPT. Uh, they are prepared to cooperate with IEA. Uh, all of that. Then, of course, what is said by us is we don't really believe in it. You are doing nasty things, or you are doing uncertain things, let's say. 
And what they are saying, we don't really believe it, you, because you've been cheating us since 1953 or throughout history, and you really are aiming at regime change. And that's what the Supreme Leader evidently believes. Mm-hmm. Uh, and he might listen to part of the American debate, by the way. I mean, not to be excluded entirely. Um, so, so it's a question then of, is it possible then, by a step by step by step approach, step by step reciprocity, to start to build an element of trust so that you can move towards that middle ground that if you only look at what is said in public pronouncements, as a matter of fact, is there. Um, and that requires then patience, diplomacy, and rather careful handling, I would say, from both sides, needless to say. And, of course, we have democracies on our side with a vigorous public debate. They have certainly not a democracy, to put it very sort of enormous human rights violations, escalating human rights violations, by the way, uh, but still a political system, as we described, that is sort of not North Korean. Mm-hmm. Uh, and accordingly, it's somewhat so difficult to interpret all of the details. So that's the challenge. Mm-hmm. So I don't want to put words in your mouth, but are you suggesting that part of this confidence-building process should involve lifting sanctions before the Iranians have committed to anything? Are well, we talk- I, I think it has to be... You have to tie this together in a package. It has to be... the Before, when, when, when the latest round of talks were started, there was an agreement that it should be based on two principles. One was step-by-step, and the second one was reciprocity. And reciprocity entails them doing things and us doing things. Uh, And then you need to shape that in different ways. And sort of sanctions relief clearly part of, because that's part of our, that's why we impose sanctions, by the way, Mm -hmm. in order to be able to lift them, to reward them for doing things. And exactly how you balance these particular things, Mm -hmm. um, that's really what the talks are about to a large extent. So you can imagine something like the normalization process between the United States and Vietnam, which to use an an overused word, there was a roadmap, there were four stages. It was about lifting sanctions and getting behavior changes uh, Mm -hmm. on either side that kind of gradually led to a process over the course of the better part of a decade to a normalization of relations. The issue is you know, who, who begins that process? I think that that's one of the... And I think it has to be begun by both at the same time. At the same time. So carefully orchestrated. Diplomacy, diplomacy, diplomacy to prepare it and then mm-hmm. to start step by step. Mm-hmm. And, and then very careful with how those steps are executed because during each part of the... During those steps, you will have people saying on both sides that they are cheating. They don't really mean it. Uh, because the the mistrust is so, so fundamental. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, the 1979 on the one side and 1953 on the other side, as well as other factors are there. Yeah. I'm going to ask you one more question and then turn to the audience. And we've got microphones out to the left and to the right, and uh, please feel free to um, go to the microphones if you have a question. The, the last question I'd like to ask before turning it over to the audience has to do with this lifting of sanctions. You mentioned it in your opening comments mm-hmm. and you just referred to it again. I think it's one of those issues that is really not appreciated how difficult it is mm-hmm. and that the, kind oh. of, the kinds of processes we're talking about uh, really require a lot of finesse. Mm-hmm. You know, to be able to lift a sanction as a reward for a particular change in policy or behavior, um, it has to be very carefully orchestrated. And in fact, um, as you mentioned, we have our Congress, we have our executive branch, there's the United Nations, there's the EU. Um, Do you think that we really have the savvy to work that kind of complex interaction? Or do you think there are lessons that the international community needs to learn about how to impose sanctions to actually think about how to lift them at the same time that we're thinking about how to impose them? No, I agree with that. Uh, when imposing sanctions, you should think about how to lift them as well. And you should not make the conditions for sanctions so complicated that in reality it is very difficult to lift them. I, I remember going back to the Iraq case. Um, I, I worked... Uh, very closely with Richard Holbrook for X numbers of years, both in the Balkans and we kept in touch over the years and we were good friends. He was a a superb individual. And and I remember prior to the, when sort of the, during the Iraq period, uh, we had a lengthy discussion on what could happen in in Iraq. 
And, and I said, can't we have some sort of agreement and then start lifting sanctions and go for some normal and see if we can then modernize this society and move in so, so mm-hmm. that sort of discussion. And Dick said to me, honestly, he said he failed to see that any U.S. Congress would ever lift any sanctions against Saddam Hussein. And he said, this is benign rationale, this is U.S. politics, forget about... He said, I agree with you, not going to happen, forget it. And if that is the case, then you are really in a policy dilemma. Mm-hmm. How on earth do you get out of it then? And uh, <laughs> there was a way of getting out of it. Whether that was the ideal one is sort of that's a separate debate. Um, but but it's very very important not to get into those sorts of situa- situations because then you have probably damaged yourself as much in terms of your policies as you've damaged the people that you want to influence the policy behavior of. Yeah, it's it it is ironic that one case where we can say that sanctions did lead to a regime getting rid of its WMD capacity is Iraq, Mm. um, with all the unintended consequences. But that's actually the great irony, that that's the one case where sanctions Or that we didn't see it. We didn't see it until too late, of course. Yeah. Yeah. And where we could also say that in... I, I think Iraq is, of course, a case where we can say clearly that it strengthened the regime. Sure. Uh, because the, the, the middle class disappeared. And, uh, I mean, what there was of a private sector disappeared. And everyone was dependent upon the food stamps handed out by the regime. So the sort of every possibility of sort of modernizing Iraq society disappeared and was strengthened Saddam Hussein. Mm-hmm. And, and that, that's, that's why there was a vigorous debate after that, whether we had not been sort of shooting ourselves in both feet at the same time. And, of course, we could find ourselves having that debate about Iran a few years down the road about would it, what sanctions have contributed to in Iranian society. Or are you not concerned about that at this juncture? Well, I, I'm always concerned about it, but, but, but I, I think we've been wise. Uh, what, what, what we did in the Iraq case was, of course, we had a total embargo. Right. Security Council total embargo. That, I think, is the only case that I can remember that we've had that in modern times. Have we had that in any other case? Well, no. for a brief period, didn't we have that in the Balkans? True, yeah. true. We had an element Serbia. of that against Serbia. That, that's, that's true. Yeah. Um, Was that's, it for the same duration, though? Not for the same duration, but, but it did produce a, n- a number Big. of negative effects, and I would say that wasn't what sorted out the Balkan Wars. Mm-hmm. But, but I vividly remember when... Uh, could you bring it up? Uh, when I came there, I had been appointed then to be sort of the EU high representative or whatever, um, and that was in the final phase of the war, and I arrived for my first meetings in Belgrade. And I hadn't been there under sanctions regime, and it was total sanctions, and, and I was uh, particularly in petrol, particularly yep. in petrol. And I arrived in Belgrade, and I find that petrol was more widely available than in Stockholm <laughs> at significantly lower prices. <laughs> That's not entirely surprising? Because you had, it, you had a petrol service at every street corner, more or less, you know, sort of plastic cans, and it was tax-free. Um, and, 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 of course, the smuggling networks coming, I shouldn't point at anyone in particular, but, I mean, those who were around know exactly what happened, were immensely profitable. Mm-hmm. And petrol was widely available. Uh, then it did have, of course, a negative effect on the economy, but, but it didn't really affect policy behavior. Yeah. Shall we go to the audience? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, sir. Thank you. I'm uh, Chris Bidwell from the Federation of American Scientists. Minister Bilt, thank you for a very uh, nice presentation, laid out, uh, laid out the issues very well. I'd like to take one of, the, uh, que- or one of the issues you raised and kind of divide it into two parts, see if the answer changes. Uh, but my, my basic <laughs> question, with, with two variants, uh, is, is, dismantling a nu- is asking Iran or North Korea to dismantle a nuclear weapons program or to stop going forward with a nuclear weapons program a specific enough uh, for sanctions to target. And when I use the word sanctions, I, I make a distinction between the type of, of, of naming and closing of accounts and then the economic pressure sanctions, which businesses uh, do, you know, go out of their way to, to avoid doing business with Iran mm-hmm. to avoid sanctions themselves. Mm-hmm. So of those two types of sanctions, are these, uh, is that goal specific enough for those sanctions to work? And if so, uh, are, are we not setting ourselves up for asking Iran or North Korea to prove a negative? that they have stopped, uh, stopped doing behavior, and, and can, they, can they do that in a practical way, prove that negative? Thank you. Well, it is, of course, very diff- 
different cases because in, in the North Korean case, they got nuclear weapons, or at least they had three of them. <laughs> Whether they have any one today, we don't know. <laughs> yeah, they might be down to one or two. Or, I don't know. But, but they, they, they are declared nuclear weapon state by now. Uh, they have the capacity, both of plutonium and we assume uranium, limited anyhow. Uh, they are publicly declaring that they want to remain as such. So it's a far more difficult nut to crack in that particular case, also for that reason and also for the reason that economic sanctions... Well, we, I mean, look at the Swedish interaction with North Korea in economic terms. What's that? It's humanitarian relief, period. Uh, would we cut that off? Well, you can debate that. That's a tricky one. That's a tricky one. But that's really... We don't really have a trade relationship. We don't have a financial relationship. We have virtually nothing. Uh, so, so the sanction instrument, both what we try to achieve is more difficult and the means available in terms of sanctions, far more limited. Iran, easier in theory, because the policy objectives that we've said, you shall not acquire nuclear weapons. Although there's a debate about some of these sort of borderline cases of capabilities, safety knowledge or whatever, but nuclear weapons, that's really, is what they are saying as well. So formally speaking, they don't need to sort of back down in policy terms that much. And we have an element of economic interaction with them. But, of course, over time, that economic interaction element between us and them does diminish. I mean, they've had, for example, as a conscious policy of the regime to get the economy less dependent upon oil. They've not been particularly successful in that. But now, of course, they are getting less dependent upon oil export for fairly obvious reasons, because we are blocking them. And... Uh, that's a painful process. But if this goes on for, I don't know, at some point in time, they will limit the exposure of their economy to these particular sanctions uh, that we have. So it's, it's, it's an easier case than the North Korean case in both these cases, but not entirely uncomplicated either. It is interesting. I think Iran has the most gasified economy yeah. in the world, the yeah. most number of vehicles running yeah. on natural gas. Yeah. Um, I'll take a question from the second microphone, please. Yes, uh, Paul Meyer, Simon Fraser University. Um, this session was entitled The Efficacy of Sanctions for Non-Proliferation. I wonder, uh, Mr. Bill, if uh, you would see in the future any prospects for applying sanctions to achieve disarmament. Against what, France? <laughs> I, 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 <laughs> Sorry, US? against... Well, I mean disarmament. You mean general disarmament? Well, uh, just, you know, I'm conscious everyone. of the twin obligations of non-proliferation and disarmament under the NPT, and I know it's interesting that the session has only looked at... Um, Punitive uh, or leverage uh, regarding non-proliferation, and I. I mean, but you mean, you mean to get about, to so. get an existing nuclear weapon states to back off nuclear weapons? Yes. Yes, I mean to achieve their disarmament uh, commitments. Well, I think the U.S. has tried that with Pakistan to some extent, although limited extent, you might argue. Uh, but it, 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 it limited military and other sort of financial interaction or whatever. I'm looking at you to get more details yeah. about it. Uh, yes. <laughs> They did that for a limited period. For a limited period of time. Right. After the tests. Until 9-11. Yeah, it yeah. uh, didn't really work. Um, is there, I mean, to take that as a particular case, is there any level of economic pain that would cause Pakistan to give up its nuclear weapons? Others might answer that. Is there any level of economic pain that would cause to be sort of rhetorical France to give up its nuclear weapons? <laughs> Um, Russia. Um, so, so the simple answer to that question is I don't think sanctions would work in these particular cases to get them to back off. I, I think this has to be sort of the general process of gradually reducing nuclear weapons in general terms, including and the particular responsibility on the two major nuclear powers to lead that particular way. 
Of course, North Korea could be regarded as exactly that, kind of sanctions for disarmament. I mean, it's a question of whether we formally refer to them as a nuclear power state Mm. or not, I suppose. Let me take a question from the first microphone. So uh, Ian Stewart from King's College London and uh, Harvard's Belfort Centre. Um, Targeted multilateral sanctions on technology, UN sanctions, are potentially, well, they're the least discussed, but potentially the most effective uh, tools for non-proliferation. So countries like Iran are dependent on Western technologies for their program. The items they currently have degrade over time, constrain it, then the capability diminishes. The challenge, of course, is that at the UN, the updating and maintenance of the lists, and frankly also the implementation of sanctions in China and other countries, is in some way hampered by economic sanctions, by unilateral sanctions. In fact, Russia and China both expressly say that they won't update uh, UN sanctions or pass more sanctions because of the unilateral stuff. Now, the unilateral stuff comes out of Congress. So my question is, how do we best manage domestic issues within sending states to have uh, sanctions be most effective? Of course, the idea is um, what's attractive to domestic audiences in Congress is the impact, the financial impact of demonstrating that you've had the impact. But what we want is is the effect. So there's a question uh, and an answer from either. Well, I mean, the, the, the easy way around that particular dilemma is, of course, the, the one that I indicated, but I'm, I, I agree it's an easy way out of it, is to only have sanctions imposed by the Security Council. Uh, then, and, and then have sort of a more a strict implementation regime. And, and, and the UN, I mean, for all of the, you can go into all of the discussions on the UN the oil for food program and all of that, but, but it has been fairly effective in uh, monitoring the implementation of sanctions. Uh, Relatively speaking, nothing is perfect in the world. Uh, Once you get into sort of the mix of sort of unilateral and bilateral and whatever sanctions, I I, I think you enter into all of these particular problems. And that is why I would prefer as much as possible of the sanctions regime to be be sort of the multilateral UN. The legality is to avoid a number of those issues that I think are very difficult to solve otherwise. Of course, from a U.S. perspective, I think a lot of U.S. policymakers would argue that American sanctions, unilateral sanctions, often kind of pave the way for multilateral sanctions in the sense that America uh, demonstrates its willingness to suffer some economic consequences for a foreign policy goal, and that gives us credibility in encouraging others to do the same. Wow, wow, yes. No, I'm saying that that's a a common... uh, No, no, true. If you look at Sudan... Uh, yeah. Libya, Iran, North Korea, Iraq, that all of these were cases where you had initially unilateral U.S. sanctions that created the basis for the U.S. to encourage others to adopt similar, although in most cases not as, as uh, comprehensive measures. But we've also seen cases where the U.S. policies have been somewhat less heroic. Cuba. Well, and, yeah, yeah. But, 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 but also where one has imposed uh, sanctions with extraterritoriality, so that you punish countries in or firms in third countries, but where there are more or less deliberate loopholes for U.S. companies, sometimes operating in other jurisdictions. I mean, I've seen examples of that happening. Yes. Um, and that, of course, causes an element of disquiet in right. the international community when that is the case. Um, and, and as you know better than me, particularly when you go to Congress here, and negotiate over sanctions and things like that. The Congress has an element to take also U.S. interest into account, while sort of foreign interests of foreign interests of sort of third countries are not necessarily taken into account in the same way. And this causes an element of friction that we've had over the years with the way that U.S. operates its 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 sort of unilateral sanctions regime, primarily in the financial field, primarily related, by the way, to Iran. I don't know yeah. of any other cases. Yeah, no, I, th- I think the U.S. Congress has shifted gears a little bit in the last few years to really look for closing any loopholes that it can find. But certainly there are cases, as you suggest, Sudan being the most obvious, where mm-hmm. loopholes were created that really mm-hmm. undermined the leadership um, argument. I'll take a question from the second microphone, please. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you so much, House Minister, for a very analytical and differentiated uh, presentation. I'm Bernd Kovic from PRIF in Frankfurt. I have a comment and a question. The comment is that as a European, you have the chance to speak to Iranians, and you get, that's the least, the message I get is twofold. First, yes, the sanctions bite. We as Iranians feel it. They don't 
my colleagues, when they are outside of Iran, they cannot use their visa card anymore. And the, the, the plane that takes them back from Vienna to Tehran has to be refueled in Dubai, otherwise it cannot land. Mm -hmm. The per same persons tell you, but that is one thing, economic effic efficacy, but on the other hand, the system controls the political decisions, and that means the counter effect of sanctions are there. That means no movement. Having been exposed in a very nice way to your very differentiated criteria, I wanted to ask you, how do you get out of this situation? In view of the fact that you once started with smart sanctions, people could not go, some people couldn't go to buy diamonds in Paris, but now you have a situation, I would say almost, almost Iraq, Iraq-like, where the population is suffering and the regime can, can put the blame on the sanctions, although, as we know, the uh, economy itself has big, big problems. To get out of this dilemma, couldn't it be that it is important to introduce the element that really gets to the major and legitimate security concerns of Iran that sanctions do not address? And I think in this case, the United States and Tehran have to probably behind, in addition to the five one, uh, P1, P5, have to do an additional bilateral talks, direct talks, in order, I think, to come to grips with their trauma, tra traumatized relationship. And my second point would be, would you agree that the element of diplomacy, which so far is very asymmetrical compared to the sanctions, should be readjust it in a way that it gets a little bit more balanced as maybe two ways, two paths of getting out of the current dilemma? Thank you. No, I, I mean, obviously I agree with all of that, um, that uh, we are in a difficult situation. We need to come out of it, uh, also for the sake of the Iranians and for the sake of the resolution of, 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 of the issue. If you look at the negotiating history, go back to 2003, I think it was, when we had uh, uh, three EU foreign ministers going to Tehran and Xavier Solana and initiated the talks and as said they had ended the program, they were in the additional protocol, they suspended enrichment and all of that. Um, the US wasn't part of it, that was a problem. Mm -hmm. The EU policy was of course to gradually drag the US into the process. And that happened, there was the meeting in Geneva whenever that was when Bill Burns, 2005 I think. Yeah. And there was the letter that was signed by Condi Rice yes. that was brought by Solana to Tehran. And they couldn't really believe it. They thought he had falsified it. Um, he hadn't. Uh, but but they, they were surprised that there, there was a gradual. And we now have a situation where the U.S. is sitting at the table. And even if it's not sort of formally engaging bilaterally in the sense that there are only Iranians and the Americans in the room, of course, there's, there's a dialogue now. Or there's an audience, you might argue. And of course, President Obama Quite. has made very clear that he Quite. was prepared to have a bilateral conversation. Absolutely. Uh, in uh, uh, you had the maybe not personally, but sorry, not personally. No, but, no, no. You know, but I mean, he's, he's, he's the president of the place, um, and and that was made very. We had in Munich a couple of uh, months ago. Mm -hmm. Vice President Biden was very explicit, and the Iranian Foreign Minister was there and listened very attentively, and and he said, yeah, yeah, yeah. He said. Let's move in that direction, although he didn't really phrase himself like that, but we are in a difficult situation at the moment, and blah, blah, blah. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, I, I, I think we are in a much better shape from that point of view now than we were a couple of years ago. Uh, is this process moving sufficiently fast? Probably not. Mm -hmm. um, should we be impatient? Yes, we should be. Uh, but should we be so impatient that we say, this is the end of it, we are not receiving anything, let's go for something else, whatever that something else is? No. I mean, you referred to the process of normalization between the United States and Vietnam. I mean, there were some problems between your countries before, mm -hmm. of a fairly profound nature, I remember, um, which meant that the normalization process did take quite considerable time mm -hmm. and involved a certain amount of pain on both sides, mm -hmm. emotional pain on both sides. Mm 
And the change in the geopolitical environment that, really made it possible. Absolutely, well. that also made it possible. Uh, see, diplomacy sometimes must be patient, but work, work, work. And if if you see the what you read, I refer only to what's in the sort of public domain on the latest talks in Almaty, that didn't bring anything really. But you can read in the newspapers that there was a real exchange of views. Um, and questions were asked, and some questions were answered, and some questions were not answered, and some questions were answered satisfactorily, and some not satisfactorily for both sides. That's, that's sort of, How by the standards of these things, progress. Because that's not what we had a couple of years ago. Um, so give it time. Uh, continue to engage, hope that something doesn't happen that derails the process in a fundamental way and takes us back to either confrontation or something else. Um, that's it. And, and I said, uh, as you said, the, the, the effect of sanctions, we must, we must try to analyze it as, as closely as we can. What, what, what I fear at the moment, I, uh, but I'm not a sufficient expert on all of it, but I, I see two things. I see that the smuggling things are, of course, run primarily by the IRGC. So they are the ones making the money at the moment. I mean, it's probably strengthening them inside the system. Mm -hmm. But somewhat in contrast to so far Iraq, the fact that the Iranian currency has gone down has, of course, increased the competitiveness on the export markets of the, uh, of the Iranians. So they are now, if we go to Iraq... Um, Iraq is the number one market for Iran at the moment and they are flooding the Iraqi market with Iranian products and, and I see that in several other places in the region that Iran is becoming a more aggressive and successful exporter of manufactured goods as an effect of their currency being devalued and their competitiveness increased um, uh, whatever we should make of that. Yeah, it's still, I think their non-oil economy is such a small part of their overall economy so that the far. advanced yeah. competitiveness there compared to the decrease in uh, oil exports. But still, probably still, it is far more, I mean, compared with Iraq, which was not a diversified, not a particularly diverse economy. It's more economy. diversified than Iraq. It, it is a significantly more diversified economy Yeah, so. uh, that we are dealing with. I think we have time for no. one last question, please. Hi, well, hello. My name is Sophia Kaunas. I'm a student at American University. Um, I, I really enjoyed the points that you've brought up. They're pretty neat, but I would like to take this in another direction. Um, let's look at the detrimental humanitarian effects that sanctions do have, in particular the economic sanctions in Iran. Um, you know, as you had said yourself before, it's easy to put sanctions into place, yet it's very difficult to lift them. Now, there's been a lot of criticism based on these sanctions, noting that we ought not look at Iran as simply a nuclear program, but let's start looking at it as a country in fear that we're actually losing a lot of goodwill from Iranian civilians. Now, can you expand a little bit as to why these humanitarian uh, detrimental effects are coming from sanctions and why this is justifiable in hopes of a regime change or in hopes of them no longer promoting their use of uh, nuclear weapons? I would just like you to touch on the, fa the fact that sanctions do harm civilians in a negative well, yeah, I, I mean, as, as you point out, I mean, Iran is a country of 70 million people. I mean, it is an impressive country, it's an old history, it's a, it's a country of talent, as we see when we look at the Iranian communities that we have in our respective countries, extremely talented, resourceful. It's a country with a huge, enormous, interesting potential for the future. And we should also treat it as such, at the same time as we have very profound disagreement with the regime, notably on human rights, but also on this particular issue. I think that differentiation is important to make in our sort of public diplomacy. Then we should, as far as we can, try to limit the humanitarian effects of sanctions. And I said, I mean, we have, when, 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 when we take our public sort of documents on the EU side, and I guess the same on this side, we always say that this is not directed against the people and things like that. We say that, and we mean it. But they all have that effect. It's the by effect is always there. You can never avoid it entirely. But we must perhaps be more careful trying to devise ways of avoiding it and also communicate very clearly the things that we do in order to try to avoid it having that particular effect. Say what I call about sort of medicines and things like that, uh, student exchanges, 
Um, I'd take another thing, uh, which has been sort of subject of controversy, telecommunications and things like that. I, I know that here, President Obama imposed, there were some uh, sanctions imposed on sort of internet technologies of different right. sorts, right. but at some point in time, you had to lift them, wisely enough, in order to get the technologies in that made it possible for people to communicate with the outside world. Uh, so there are things that we must sort of be careful that we don't limit and, as a matter of fact, get into the country and communicate those things more clearly so that people perhaps somewhat more clearly see that this is not meant to be directed against them or that we should not be naive. The side effects are always going to be there. The side effects may not always be there. We may have these good intentions, but if you don't mind me to allow or a follow-up, perhaps... If we've had we're actually a little short on time, so if you could make okay. it very quick. Well, I mean, we, we, we see these detrimental effects all the time, right? We say that they're not going to harm the civilians as much as they can, but, you know, the United States currently has the power to promote or to sell medicine in Iran, but because of the, the shaky market, no one wants to go in there. So how, yeah. how do we continue to help the c- civilians, even though saying that, yeah, there are these negative aspects of these sanctions still exist? No, we, we, have, we have the same. I, as I said, in the in the decision, I think we had sort of a ceiling for... Uh, was it? I'm looking at my. It was 100,000 euros, uh, which I think was you can you can do deals up to 100,000 euros individual sort of a transaction uh, for pharmaceuticals and things like that. Uh, uh, that's a fair amount of money, so that should be able to facilitate quite a lot of this. In spite of that, we see these things going down. It's not happening, and that is because of the financial institutions simply being afraid of doing it or simply not being aware of the fact that we have these windows in the sanctions. And then we have not been communicating that sufficiently clear from our side to the Iranian population, to the financial institutions, and to others. And that we must be better at doing, both devising these windows that are necessary and communicating them and making certain that they actually operate. I I, I think that would be good for the humanitarian point of view, I think it would also, as a matter of fact, be good in making them politically more effective in so far as they can be that. Great. Thank you. Um, before I turn it back over to George, um, I wanted to thank you for a very informative conversation, one that I think shed light on actually sanctions as a tool, um, but also shed light on the current crises or international challenges that we have. So thank you very much for sharing your views with us, and thank you all uh, for joining us this afternoon. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.